the presidential election, I probably wouldn't choose anybody. I think it's pretty exhausting. I don't really like either one of the candidates. And if, and if we allow these things to divide us, we are in trouble. It's uh, a little bit like a wreck. It's, it's fascinating. It's a wreck. And you cannot take your eyes off it. But it's not inspiring, that's for sure. Neither of these people represent me and what I stand for. And so I don't want to do this because I feel like both of them are going to bring about negative changes in the democracy. As voters go to the polls this year, in many quarters, the mood is decidedly downbeat. Voters overwhelmingly tell us that they're having a negative reaction to the campaign. Greg Smith is Associate Director of Research at the Pew Research Center, which has been polling voters throughout the pre-election season. Many of them say that they're disgusted by it, that they're disappointed. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not engaged. In fact, many of them are engaged. But by and large, people tell us that they are very unhappy with the state of this campaign. We know in Smith our says the high levels of negativity between, can be seen in the nature of the support for the candidates. On both sides, we're seeing people tell us that the support for their candidate is driven as much by opposition to the other side. That's not just true of Trump supporters, many of whom say that they are supporting Trump uh, primarily as a matter of opposing Clinton. The same thing is true on the other side. There are many Clinton supporters who say that they're supporting Clinton for president mainly as a matter of opposing Trump. The negativity among voters often takes on a moral dimension. Many people of faith are among those raising concerns about the rhetoric that has dominated the campaign. We have fissures that have formed among the people that are being, uh, that are being widened by this rhetoric and that are tearing us apart as a beloved community that we had tried to work for from the time of Dr. King. And we should be talking about what we can do to make this a more moral world, about, about what we can achieve for our, our fellow human beings. And, you know, instead it's become ugly, vitriolic mudslinging, and it, it just, just, you know, breaks my heart as somebody who loves this republic. Some voters question whether they can in good conscience vote for either candidate. Chad Pecknold is professor of systematic theology at Catholic University of America. A pro-life Catholic, Pecknell tends to be politically conservative. This year, he says, he's very conflicted. Donald Trump is such an uh, abnormal candidate, as such a candidate of evident viciousness. That hasn't inclined me to vote for Hillary Clinton because of her position on abortion. So where does that leave you for November 8th? It leaves me not voting for Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. Um, I don't know where it leaves me in terms of whether or not I leave the top slot blank. It leaves me thinking that all my down ticket choices have to be about um, advancing the common good and resisting the evils that I think can come from a corrupt executive. Some voters are planning on voting for a third party candidate. Others may write in another option. Many say they feel forced to vote for the lesser of two evils. Reverend Carolyn Davis, Deputy Director of the Center for Public Theology at Wesley Theological Seminary, says from a Christian perspective, all candidates fall short. When we vote, we always vote for a less than perfect option. Certainly one is free to say, look, there are no good choices here in this particular race. We think about voting as not the lesser of two evils, but who advances the good the best and does the least harm. Steve Schneck of Catholic University says Pope Francis has urged people to vote their consciences through a citizenship of prudence. We need to carefully think and sift and make our choices, not expecting that we're going to, you know, to solve once and for ever the, you know, the problem of sin in the world, but make what progress we can in what incremental ways are available to us. Rabbi Moline, who's president of Interfaith Alliance, agrees that even if people are unhappy with their choices, they have a moral obligation to vote their values. When you walk into the voting booth, I've, I have compared it to the Holy of Holies in the ancient temple. A, ta a, a curtain is closed behind you. You are alone with your God and your vote. People will cast their votes listening to their hearts. When they come out of the voting booth, they have to return to listening to each other. Voting is the way uh, we begin to fulfill our social obligation to one another 
to hold one another in care. And that's something that is common in many of our religious traditions, I would argue all. So I encourage you to please go and vote. Vote your conscience, vote your perspective, but vote. Indeed, many faith traditions are encouraging their members to vote. In several areas, churches have been sponsoring Souls to the Polls projects, where congregants are bused to polling places after services for early voting. Make sure that whatever you need in life is covered by the person that you are voting for. Davis says it's good to remember that voting is not just a privilege, but a hard fought for right. Not too long ago, African Americans from across the South got together and marched across a bridge facing beatings, dogs, hoses, because there was something critical about being able to go to the polls to vote for leaders that represented them. Many religious groups are also urging a time of prayer for the nation prior to the election. In Washington, several spiritual traditions held a chant for change gathering. You know, the political leaders ultimately are only a reflection of the people. And with the amount of tension and nastiness that's going on, I think if, if the American people didn't like it, then that would stop. So I think this group, you know, they're all saying that, hey, let's change the tenor of the conversation here, and it needs to start with us. Beyond the election, Moline says the faith community will also have an obligation to help the nation to heal. There have certainly been enough religious communities that have promoted the divisive issues in this campaign. Now it's time to think about what our responsibilities to our real values and our real faith are. To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. Chief among those responsibilities, he says, will be rebuilding relationships and rebuilding trust, trust in one another and trust in our system of government. There's an old Hasidic saying that people like to sing. The world is a narrow bridge, but the important thing is not to be afraid. I think we all know that we're we're on tenuous ground wherever we are in this world with, with all of the issues that face us. And there are lots of things to be afraid of. But the essence is not to be afraid, to walk with other people across that narrow bridge to get to the other side, whatever the promise is of what's on the other side. I'm Kim Lawton in Washington.